Hey friends, my name is Yi and welcome to a new video for IGCC Geography. And today we have a new video for theme 3 of the course, which is 3.1 for development. And here are the specifications from the website. And in this video, we have one case study, which is a transnational corporation, which will look at Walmart. So starting with indicators of development, here are some key terms for this, um, this subtopic. We have development, which is the, basically the use of resources to improve the quality of life in the country. And then we have gross national product or GNP, which is actually different from GDP, which we'll look into it later. So GNP is the total value of goods and services produced by a country in a year. And it's plus or included the income earned by the country's residents from foreign investment and minus income earned within the domestic economy or by overseas residents. So it sounds very complicated, which it sound, which it is. So we'll compare it to GDP in a minute, which will be much clearer. But then we also have purchasing power parity or PPP, and it's the income data that have been adjusted to take into account of differences in the cost of living between countries. So we have the indicators of development for um, of different factors that can be used. So development can be measured in multiple ways more than uh, other than just wealth. For example, we can use GMP per capita, literacy rate in a country, which is basically the percentage of a population of a given age group that can read and write, and a life expectancy, which basically relates to the healthcare of a country and how advanced they are in the healthcare industry, as well as infant mortality rate, which is related to life expectancy, where they look into the healthcare of a country. Then we have GMP versus GDP. So as mentioned just now, we look into GMP, whereas GDP, or the gross development product, is the total value of goods and services a country produces within a year. So we have this quick example right here. Let's say we have two countries, so um, country A and country B. They each have factories, basically A factory, A, 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 A from country A, whereas country B has factories B, 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 B in both countries as well. So let's say each factory produces 1 million uh, pound in revenue each year. So from this diagram, we can see that country's A GDP is 5 million because GDP is basically uh, only concerned with what's happening within a country. So country A has five factories. So it has three factory A and two factory B. So it has a GDP of 5 million, 5 million pound. Whereas for country B, it has a GDP of 7 million, as it has 1, 2, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So country P has a GDP of 7 million pound. Whereas if we were to look at GMP, the gross national product, it's specific only concerned with the country's own factory. So for example, for country A, it has three factories in country A and three factories in country B. So its GMP is 6 million pound. Whereas for country B, it has a GMP of also 6 million pound because it has four factories in country B, its own country, and two factory B in country A. So that's the difference between GDP and GMP. Then we we'll look at Human Development Index or HDI. And it's created by the United Nations as a measure of the, of the disparities between countries using life expectancy at birth, mean years of schooling for adults aged 25, the expected years of schooling for children and school entering age, and the GNI per capita. So it's basically quite a lengthy definition, but what you need to know is that H, uh, the HDI basically takes into account of many different factors, more than just wealth. So as I mentioned, HDI was created by the UN in 1990 to try and measure the, the development of a country apart from monetary value. So using this HDI index, 1 is the highest and 0 is the lowest. And the score for, uh, of like 0 0.800 or greater shows a very high human development of a country. So let me just zoom in right here. So we have this HDI um, index or um, ranking by country as of 2021. So as you can see, the highest are right here. They're like for example, Switzerland, Norway, Iceland, and so on. And you can see the, all the different countries. 
Then we have inequalities between countries. So here are some more key terms. We have LDCs or least developed countries, which are the poorest of the developing countries with major economic, institutional and human resources problem. Whereas NIC or newly industrialized countries are basically nations that, has, that have undergone rapid and successful industrialization since the 1960s. So here's some quick note. Countries basically go through different stages of development, like development over time. So it'll go from least developed country to developing to newly industrialized country or NIC to finally developed country. So this term called the four Asian tigers are basically commonly thrown around or used and they refer to countries uh, include these four, the South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong. And their economies grew rapidly due to excellent infrastructure, FDIs or foreign direct investment from corporations and the ready availability of bank loans at attractive interest rates, which basically prompts the people to grow the economy of those countries or those nations. Then we have development gap. So due to inequality between countries, there's a development gap. And there are many factors that causes this development gap due to physical geography factors, economic policies, and demography. So looking more at physical geography, landlocked countries and small island countries have a dis disadvantage because they are quite isolated or like they are basically, um, they have lack of natural resources. So they, it's also a big factor. For example, the availability of oil and minerals. And for economic policies, open economies in the country is better than closed economies as they welcome foreign direct investment, which is basically investment from um, foreign countries or foreign companies or for foreign corporations. And demography is basically determined by the population structure of a country and this affects the labor force of a country. And this relates to the working population, which is saw in our first topic, which is population in the course. And due to this development gap, there's quite some consequences, which you look at it now. So the consequences can split into several different categories, including economic and, uh, and political, social and environmental. Starting with economic and political, Countries at the lower development stage won't have attractive job opportunities, which means that there's a high percentage of population in poverty. And the system of government also affects the development. And then we have social, where the literacy rate of a country affects the ability of its population to obtain better jobs. So if a country has a high literacy rate, this means that all the people there or most people there are quite illiterate or they know how to read and write. So there's better job opportunities in those areas. And access to clean water and basic sanitation also can affect the development of a country. And then we also have environmental. So countries with natural disasters need to spend more money and resources on rebuilding those structures. So those money can be spent on some on let's say facilities that can be used to improve the development of a country. And then we have this concept called Gini coefficient, which is basically a technique used to show the extent of income inequality. And it's a scale measured from one uh, from zero to a hundred, and the closer a country's Gini index is to zero, the more equal the country is, and vice versa. So basically, we have this graph right here of a national of national income against population. So it can be basically it's from one point here to the other point here. So it can be drawn uh, with different curves. For example, it can be drawn like a straight line, a uh, curve like this or like this curve and so on. This straight line basically indicates a Gini index of zero and it shows perfect equality. Whereas basically this line right here, like um, against the x-axis and up, shows a perfect inequality. And the gap between it is called the inequality gap. So in general, more wealthy countries have a lower income yet than lower income countries. And there are some countries with a high in the, uh, income in the world inequality, for example, in Southern Africa or in Southern America. And an example of low income inequality include countries in Europe. And then we look at inequalities within countries. So there are many factors that affect inequalities within countries, for example, due to housing, 
where the conditions of people's residence can impact their quality of life significantly, as shown here, which is quite a famous photo, which demonstrates the inequality within a country. So we have quite a good residential area over here, whereas there's slums or like low-income housing over here. And then we also have ethnic and employment, where different ethnic groups might be treated differently, which results in discrimination, and they might not be as employed as other ethnic groups in the same country. And this also affects the pay of different ethnic groups. And then we also have education, where high levels of education result in a higher literacy rate. And this means better paid employment and better job and higher salary. And then we have the different economic sectors. So we have the primary, secondary, tertiary and quaternary. Where primary sectors is basically industries that exploit raw materials from land and water and air. For example, mining or fishing because they directly exploit the raw materials. And then we have secondary sector, which is basically uh, manufacturing the primary materials into finished products. So we're saving the stuff from the primary sector and turn it into something useful. And then the tertiary is a part of the economy that provides service to the businesses and to people. For example, teachers and architects because they provide service. And quaternary is industries that use higher technology to provide information and expertise. For example, R&D or research and design. And we'll now look at the Clark Fisher model that is part of the employment structure notes. So the Clark Fisher model, as shown on the right here, is a graph that basically shows the percentage of a country's employment by sector as the country moves from the pre-industrial phase to the post-industrial phase. So we can see how the different the number of diff the number of uh, percentage of people employed in the different sectors change as the country um, advances. So we can analyze this. So in the pre-industrial phase, we can see that there's, there's, um, there's no quaternary sector. And it is in, the, in those countries, it's dominated by primary sector. For example, mining or fishing or farming. And there's little secondary and tertiary. So as the country industrializes or advances, the primary sector decreases and people are employed in higher paying jobs for example, in the secondary sector or in the tertiary sector. So as a country moves from industrial to post-industrial where they are very developed already, the secondary sector will decrease and the tertiary sector will increase and most people, most people are employed in the tertiary sector and because they provide services to the consumers and organizations. And we can also see that quaternary sectors start to increase in the post-industrial because these countries have sufficient technology and money to invest in these R&D. And then we have globalization and TNC. So globalization is the increasing interconnectedness and interdependence of the world economically, culturally, and politically. And TNC is transnational cooperation, and it's a firm that owns or controls productive operations in more than one country through foreign direct investment or FDI. And in short, TNC is a company that, is, that operates in more than one country, but they can export raw materials and produce goods. And examples of famous TNCs include Nike, McDonald's, and Apple. And one quick note is that TNC causes the multiply effect. And this can be thought of as a snowball effect on, or like basically chain, re, uh, chain reaction. So for example, uh, let's say a hotel is a TNC, right? Once a hotel is set up in one location, let's say the hotel is right here. When, let's say the hotel is set up in one location, this means other companies are attracted to basically enter the area because they, they, they can see that there's this famous TNC hotel right here. This means that more jobs are created directly and indirectly from these, um, from in this sector by this hotel right here or the TNC. This leads to more taxes spent on infrastructures meaning that the area becomes more popular, meaning more hotels might set up in that area, which causes a chain reaction, which we call this the multiplier effect. Then we have more notes on globalization, and we'll look into its advantages and disadvantages. So advantages include globalization creates employment, and it typically happens in developing countries. And it also lowers the prices of goods, and it also creates cultural diversity, because these TNCs 
are very big and international. However, the disadvantage is that this might lead to exploitation of labor in developing countries, and it might also cause environmental damage due to building on greenfield sites. So there's greenfield site and brownfield site. So greenfield site are basically sites that are not previously built. For example, it's originally forest, so a country or like the, um, the, construction, the construction company cuts down all the trees and builds something on it, build buildings on it. That's the greenfield site. Whereas brownfield site is basically an existing building already, and the company basically renovates it and build, build uh, using those buildings, or like basically take over those buildings, and it's called brownfield site. And here are the impacts of globalization from the, on the global scale, national scale, and local scale, which I'll skim through. And globalization can basically promote the growth of a nation or an area's economy due to the multiply effect, as I mentioned. And it also will lead to the global movement of commodities around the world due to trade routes. However, as I mentioned, it will cause environmental de uh, degradation or environmental damage. And this thing called cultural diffusion is basically the process of spreading cultural traits to different places. And as I mentioned, globalization allows cultural diffusion to happen as a TNC is very international, so people in the TNC move around and ideas and values circulate around the world. And it also promotes mass tourism. On the national scale, we have globalization might lead to a loss of political power as these TNC companies might get too big and have too much power. And in many countries, sorry, the power of national governments has been lost to TNCs as they have increased their influence and power in many countries. And this also leads to anti-globalization movements in many countries to voice concerns over issues caused by globalization. And then on the local scale, we have, because these TNC companies set up, set up in a, a, like a local area, small local businesses find it hard to compete with these big TNCs as the TNCs have better reputation and have lower prices due to economies of scale. And local communities have also become more multicultural due to the influence of TNCs, which could be good. And then lastly, due to TNCs and job opportunities, there has been an increase in international migration, which means that families are now more likely to be spread over different countries. And now we have one case study, which is a transnational corporation and its global links and we'll look at Walmart. So here's a quick note or background of Walmart. So Walmart is created by Sam Walton in 1962, beginning with just one store, and in present day, there are over 10,000 stores worldwide. So here are its global links. Walmart has operations in 24 countries and sources pro uh, product from more than 100 countries around the world. And the first store was located in, um, in the US, which grew to Mexico and then to these countries right here in the 1990s. So, and also Walmart has certain um, largest producer and largest country or factory in certain parts of the world due to cheaper prices. And then we have the positive and negative effect from the Walmart, which is a TNC. So from the positive, we have Walmart created a lot of job and opportunities in different countries. And this is seen in Argentina, where the opening of three new stores created over 450 new jobs. And as a transnational corporation, Walmart has a great influence in the world, and they have started to invest in sustainable development, which is a good start and a good influence to companies or corporations around the world. And Walmart founded the Walmart Foundation that supports programs that align with their philanthropic vision. And, and in 2023, Walmart and the Walmart Foundation donated more than $1.7 billion annually in cash. And then here we have the negative effects. So this term called the Walmart effect is coined and is used to refer to large companies like Walmart that will cause or like that causes local businesses to feel the competitiveness. And this might drive small local businesses to go out of business, as I mentioned earlier, because these companies, these, these TNCs have uh, lower prices and has a greater reputation. And wages across Walmart stores around the world are not equal. In the US, it's around $6 an hour, but in China, after conversion or after comparing, it's only about $1 per hour. And also, Walmart takes up a lot of space. 
For example, in the US, Walmart supercenters have an average of 17,000 meters squared of land area. And large stores cause issues like heavier traffic, excessive land consumption, and sport land character. And that's it for this video. And that's it for this video for 3.1 for development. And I hope you all enjoyed this video. And if you need any more learning resources or any teaching resources, you can check out my website in the description or you can type it up in your browser at www.emixeteasy.com. And I hope you all enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next video for another video in the IGCC Geography playlist for Theme 3 as well, where Theme 3 refers to the economic development in the specification. And that's it for this video and I'll see you all in the next video. Here's to learning made easy.